Hi, good morning, or wherever it is where you are. Welcome to our C++ day. I'm Kate Gregory with James McNellis, and we're going to try to fit into a single day what you need to know about C++, which is a general purpose language and a library. We'll try to cover both the language and some of the highlights of the library in a single day. I like to say that I've been using C++ since before Microsoft had a C++ compiler. Um, that's a really long time, it's over 20 years, and, uh, and I was programming before that. C++ is a language I absolutely love, and I love telling people about it and uh, sharing with people why I love it so darn much. And uh, I hope for, you'll fall for it a little bit over the course of the day. And I'm James McNellis. Um, I'm currently a software developer here at Microsoft. Uh, I work on the Visual C++ Libraries team where I maintain our C standard library implementation. Uh, I've been using, I have not been using C++ quite as long as Kate, um, only for about 15 years or so uh, since Visual C++ 6, so. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're a baby. <laughs> <laughs> Here's how uh, we're going to spend this, this time together. Um, first, we'll get you started with tools and uh, some of the basic structure of a C++ program and some of the things you need to know about the language. Then we'll have a uh, a pretty dense module too, uh, all about the fundamentals of the language, the keywords, the punctuation. We have a lot of punctuation. We like it, and uh, we'll try to get you to like it. Then we'll move into uh, objects. You know, C++ is an object-oriented language which defines classes, and uh, you need to know what an object is, what a class is, and how they operate in C++. With that behind us, we can then do references, indirection, inheritance, pointers, and a wonderful C++ idiom called Resource acquisition is initialization. Uh, I'll hold my hand up to this. As C++ people, we are terrible at naming things, but the things we name so terribly are amazing, <laughs> and uh, this qualifies. Then we'll do the standard library. Many people call that STL. It's its nickname. And many C++ developers ignore it, which is foolish. So we'll tell you why you should love it and how it can make your life easier, not harder. And. Um, that will get you a foundation. That will get you to know what C++ is and what it can be for. So we'd like to close out the day with what could you do next? Where can this take you? Once you get this language and you know this syntax, then what can I build? Can I write a phone app? Yes. Can I write a Windows app? Yes. Can I write a server app? Yes. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. My hope is you've written some code in something before. C++ in a day is a pretty daunting topic. Uh, several people told James and I we were a little bit crazy. If we have to sort of explain what a loop is or why you might want to do something multiple times, then we're going to have a time problem. So our expectation is that you know those sorts of things. You don't have to have any C++ background or, or any language with brace brackets and semicolons. To the extent that you may have met a language like, say, JavaScript in the past, you may recognize some of the things that we're going to show you that'll help, but it's not necessary. If you would like uh, to get a book, if you're a book person, you, you brought this book in, I right? did, yes. I did bring a copy of this book. The C++ Primer by uh, Lipman, LaJoy, and Moo. Uh, great book if you want to get started. As the name says, get you started. It's a primer. Yeah, it doesn't really matter what your uh, level of expertise is. It's a, uh, like, I even learned things uh, from reading the book, quite a few things. So it's, it's great. It, it starts off with a pretty smooth introduction. And the most important thing about this particular book that I like is that it's, um, it, it shows uh, modern C++. So C++ is a really old language, and so it doesn't show any of the old 30-year-old stuff that you don't need to worry about until very late in the book, where it's like, well, you may see code that uses this, but you know, don't use it in new code. And that's really the approach that we're going to take today as well. We are going to start with simple modern constructs and not show you the 30-year-old uh, backwards compatible that people really shouldn't be writing anymore. If you'd like to follow along, you can download Microsoft Visual Studio Express 2013 for Windows Desktop. I, speaking of being bad at naming things, yes. <laughs> I mean, hey. it's, it's completely accurate, and it's important. Every component of that name is important. You want to make sure you get the for Windows desktop. That's a free download. We're going to be demonstrating using Visual Studio 2013 Ultimate, but I tested every one of our demos in the Express, and they all work just perfectly in that product. So you can go ahead and download that. And I think, James, you have that download page up on your I screen? I do, yes. 
So if just, I mean, that's what to search for, and then you know, click the big red download button, and away you go. And it's, it, I think they've really streamlined the install too. It's kind of a one click. Yes. And that's it. You're installed. We've put together the sample code for today, and I put it on my blog yesterday, just before I got on the plane. And uh, we have a link to that here in the slides. And have you got that page up? Mm -hmm. So there should be an attachment to that blog post so that people can uh, download the, uh, the code. We'd like to encourage you to get involved with the MVA community to take not just this day, but other online learning that is appropriate to what you want to learn. There's a million people already registered and uh, playing along. You can get points uh, for having attended here. Use that URL on the screen and the code C++ uh, until December 20th uh, to get 50 points for having spent the day with us, as well as learning the basics of the C++ language. So our first module, we just want to get you started. What tool do I use? How do I write code? Um, what the heck is C++ and why is it like this? And then to actually start into some of the, fun the fundamentals, the sort of cornerstones of, of how the language works and being a strongly typed language. As I mentioned, we're going to use Visual Studio 2013 Ultimate. You can use whatever you like. Uh, the commands and the menus are the same for Visual Studio Ultimate and for Visual Studio Express. And I'll show you those at least to get started and uh, talk a little bit about what makes C++ C++. It's possible that you're not a Windows person and you don't want to use Visual Studio Express or any other flavor of Visual Studio. C++ is a cross-platform language. It works on platforms other than Windows. And on the isocpp.org, that's the home of standard C++, you can find a getting started page. Do you have that up? Mm -hmm. Which will provide you with compilers for other platforms, as well as online IDEs that let you simply not install anything on your own computer at all, but put some code into a web page and watch it uh, compile, see what happens. That's a really obviously low impact or no impact way to get started and to play around, especially with newer features of the language. And there's also one of those for Visual C++, so you can even try out our compiler. Without installing which, it? Yes. There you go. Well, with that, I think it's time for the traditional first C++ demo, uh, Hello World. Um, I don't know who started that. I, I assume <laughs> it was long before I was born, yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, take it away. Yes. So what I have here is basically the simplest C++ program we can think of. So this program um, will print out Hello World. So I can run it here. And you can see it prints Hello World and then waits for us to exit. Um, the important thing to see here is uh, this line here, which is a statement that does the printing. Um, other, so other important things here in the, in the, in the IDE, um, the Solution Explorer basically is just a list of all the files that you're going to be building. So here we have just one CPP file. Uh, you can split your code across many files, uh, and in any you know, non-toy program you'll have lots of C++ files. Um, the output window here at the bottom is where the output of uh, compilation happens. So it's not where the output of your program goes, it's just when you uh, compile your code, um, it shows up here. Um, so yeah, that's I think the basics that, that's, of that's the to get them started. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the other thing we should probably say there's a lot of buttons here. Like there are tons of menus with lots of buttons and lots of advanced features, and I don't even know what most of them do, and you probably won't either. And that's totally fine. Like you'll learn to use the pieces that you need, and when you need something new. You know, you'll you'll be able to find it. Exactly, exactly. the The worst way to get started in Visual Studio is to sort of explore all the menus and all the buttons and try to understand what on earth they're for, because some of them uh, may not even apply to the kind of application that you're building. Now, when James executed that code, um, it just ran. But there's actually quite a lot that happens uh, when you build a C++ application. The first thing that happens is we say that the code is built. And that in itself is a multi-step process. First, uh, a tool called the preprocessor goes through your code 
and uh, manipulates it a little bit, the output of the preprocessor goes to something called the compiler. As James mentioned, real programs have lots of files in them, like not just five or ten, but thousands. And each one is compiled individually, and the output of that is called an object file. After everybody's been compiled, then they're linked together into your actual executable, the thing that you run under the debugger or without the debugger. Now, when you're writing these individual files, the compiler makes sure that you've used the syntax of the library correctly. For example, the single uh, line of useful code in there had quite a lot of syntax. It had bits and pieces of punctuation that you will understand by the time we're done. And the compiler makes sure that all that punctuation is being used properly. It doesn't necessarily check every single thing about your program. You are allowed to basically make a promise to the compiler. I'd like to call this piece of code that I swear to you will be somewhere else. The linker makes sure that those promises are being kept. And it puts all the somewhere else's together and connects everybody to the places they were planning to use. And OK, this is good. It all works. Those three steps of building are actually critical to understanding what happens when you get error messages. I've been teaching people C++ a very long time. And most people don't read their error messages at all. They don't even necessarily read the message part that tells them what the mistake is. But they also don't notice that in C++, you're told whether the error is a compiler error or a linker error. And that's vital to being able to solve the problem. So let's look at this little piece of code again that you saw in the demo. This first line is actually a preprocessor directive because it starts with, well, opinions vary on what that starts with. I say number sign. You I think say, it's a pound. You say yeah. pound. And nowadays, some people say hash and yes. hash or tag. Or sharp. And sharp. Sharp is also common. It's even common. worse. Yes. <laughs> so um, we'll be bilingual. I'll, I'll be saying number sign, and, and James will be saying pound. I actually often don't even pronounce it. I'll just say include. But you have to know that that, that symbol goes to the beginning of the line. And this brings a library in. In this particular example, it's the library that knows how to write characters on the screen for a console output, because this is a console application. And that IO there in IO stream stands for uh, input and output. Input and output by stream. We're writing this console application. You saw the output just came up in a big black box. There are more complicated applications. You can write Windows apps and games and things. But then we'd need literally hundreds of lines that surrounded the kind of meat that we wanted to show you. With the console application, we really only need three or four lines around it. So that's why we're showing you console applications today. The cool thing about C++ is that every scrap of syntax and library that you learn to write a console application, you can immediately use to write any other kind of application at all. So when you write a console application, just treat this next little bit as, as magic. You say int main, open round bracket, close round bracket. Some people also say parenthesis. Braces. Then there's a brace. And at the very bottom of the slide, there's an end brace. All of that's like the magic chrome that makes this a console application. And in the middle is the good stuff. And std colon colon c out means console output, writing to the big black box. The less than signs are supposed to look like arrows. So we're going to shoot hello world to the console output. And then we're going to shoot an end line after that. And that's exactly what you saw when this application ran. So that's the basic structure of a C++ application. This is code that you as a human type into a file. And then you ask Visual Studio to build that into something that can execute. So our next demo is drilling a little more into just what building means. Mm -hmm. So like Kate said, the first time that we ran this, it just ran. We didn't have to do any building. That's because we built it before we started uh, this lesson. Um, so I can build it now again. Um, on the build menu, there's a set of options. Build will just build things if they haven't, if they're not already built. Rebuild will will basically delete everything that was built and start from scratch. Um, so we can see here in the output window, the uh, output from the build. It's important to note that there's there's several lines here. So this first line here it has the name of the source file, and so this is printed out by the compiler when it's uh, when it's um, uh, compiling that source file. And then after that, the linker will uh, go and take all the object files produced by the compiler and link them together. And this last line tells you that that succeeded, and it's copied the executable, which I am having trouble highlighting, um, to the location where the, uh, the IDE will run it. So after we've built it, then we can run again. 
Um, so Visual Studio isn't just a tool for you know writing code and, and building things. Uh, one of its, I would argue, the most useful feature that it has is it's also a debugger. And a debugger allows you to step through the code uh, as it's running. So you don't need to run a whole program all at once. Uh, you can stop execution at certain points and you know, be able to step through it and see what each, uh, each individual statement, uh, what the effects are. So to do that, uh, what you need to do is you need to set a breakpoint, which tells the debugger, hey, when you reach this particular point during execution, um, you need to uh, stop. So I'm going to add a breakpoint here to the first line of our main function. And I'm going to run in the debugger by pressing this local Windows debugger button with the play sign. So we can see that our program is running here, but it hasn't printed anything yet, and it's just sitting there, and we can't interact with it. Um, and over here in, the, in, the, uh, in Visual Studio, you can see that there's a little yellow arrow here. And what that means is that we're currently paused, so execution of the, pro the program is not, is not going anywhere. It's just sitting there, um, and it's waiting. Uh, to do this next statement until we tell it to. So what we can do is we can step over that statement. And so it, it has now executed the statement that we are on, and it's reached the return zero. And so if we go back to the program, we can see that indeed it's printed the hello world. Um, we can come back here, and we can again step over the return zero, but that will cause the program basically to stop running. So I'm just going to press continue, and the program will exit because it's done. Uh, when you're running in the debugger, it doesn't wait for um, you to hit any key to return. It just it just ends the program, and we can see here that the program "Hello World" has exited with with code zero, and code zero is the typical return that means "Hey, I succeeded." Um, one other thing to note is uh, Visual Studio tries to make it easy for you to know whether you're debugging or in editing mode. So right now we're in editing mode, and you can tell because there's this blue bar at the bottom, and when we're in debugging mode, there's an orange bar at the bottom that will show you the status and other things. And at the top, it, it says, oh, I'm debugging. Um, if you're running a program and you, uh, you don't want to continue, like you, you've figured out what the problem is and you want to go make changes to it, or if you, know, you, you want to start over, um, you can stop debugging, which will immediately terminate the application by pressing this red stop sign. Um, and if you want to restart from the beginning, you can press this restart button, which looks like a little... I don't know what it looks like. Um, and you can press that, and it'll, it'll restart the program. Um, so I think those are the major features of the debugger that are most important. Do you want to show the debug menu for people who yes. uh, may not find their way around the toolbar? Yes. So in addition, like debugging is not particularly useful if you can just step through your program. Uh, it's also important to be able to uh, inspect the current state of your program. And so there's a number of uh, windows. Um, this window here is the call stack window, which shows you the functions that are being called. And we'll look at that a bit more later. Um, there's also a breakpoints window, and it'll show you a list of all the breakpoints you've put in your program. So for example, we only have one here, but I could add another one to the return statement, and you can see it's added there. Um, over here, there are a number of windows. The autos, locals, and watch window are all used for viewing uh, local variables, which we'll introduce in the next module. And then here in the debug menu, uh, there's a bunch of tools that allow you to you know, step over statements or step into a function if you're calling a function. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at a few of these later. Um, and then under Windows, there's a whole bunch of uh, other windows that you can view. And some of these are used for, you know, advanced debugging. Um, generally, the, the autos, the, the watch windows, are the most useful and the ones that people use most of the time, that and the call stack that we already have open. Yeah. The uh, Visual Studio's complexity is partly caused by the fact that it gives you a minimum of three ways to do everything, yeah. uh, a bare minimum. You can choose it off a menu, you can click a button on the toolbar, and you can press an F key. That's just to invoke the exact same command. Then there's typically multiple commands to achieve anything that, that you want to do. And some of this has to do with just how long the product's been around for. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody likes their options taken away. So when someone has a great idea and adds a new capability, they don't take the old one away. Um, until this version, for example, there were eight different ways to find in Visual Studio. I'm not surprised, yes. Uh, it, it's also, it, it's not like Visual Studio has always been one product. It used to be there were different IDEs for different environments. So there was a Visual Basic IDE and a, uh, a Visual, uh, Visual C++ IDE. And then uh, slowly they converged to become one, um, 
you know, one product and we're still working on conversions. On conversions, so, exactly. Yeah. So if, uh, you know, we're going to try to do things with the mouse so that you can see what we're doing. But, you know, you're a developer. You probably like to have your hands on the keyboard. You want to hit F keys. That's fine. And if you want to learn what the F keys are, just look on the menus. So that debug menu that listed step over, step into, step out, reminds you of the F keys and also reminds you of the toolbar button. And if you hover over the toolbar button in Visual Studio, it reminds you of the F key. So there's lots of the ways to do every given thing. Yeah. So I guess um, there's a couple more things we want to show you about this source code here. Um, the first is that uh, in C++, white space is used to separate things. But um, new lines are not relevant. So a new line is, the same as a, is basically the same as a space for, for most things in the language. So for example, you know, we could, we could break this, this statement up into lines and build it, and the compiler is still quite happy compiling it. Um, we can put the spaces back and it'll still compile successfully. The other thing uh, is these little semicolons here. Um, every statement in C++ needs to end with a semicolon. Uh, if you don't end it with a semicolon, you're likely to get an error from the compiler. And if you don't, then something else has gone wrong. Um, you can see here in the output window, since I just built this without the semicolon, you can see that it's compiling hello world.cpp, uh, but then it has an error message here. Now this is not the most convenient form of errors. So uh, in the view menu, there is an error list window. Whoops. And so this just shows you a list of the errors. And you can double click them, and it'll take you to the line on which it had the error. Um, so C++ is a little funny. Often the compiler doesn't know that there's been an error until it reaches something it's not expecting. So here. Um, we have this std endl, which means print the end line, and then all of a sudden there's a return, and the compiler doesn't know why there's a return there. It would have expected there to be a semicolon before that. So here you can see that it says there's a syntax error. There's a missing semicolon before the return. It doesn't say anything about this first line, so you should just be aware of that, that oftentimes the compiler is going to complain about things that come after where the error is, because it doesn't realize that there's an error until it's too late. Until Exactly. If you look and you say there's nothing wrong with this line, you might be right. Look at the line before it. Yep. Especially look at the end of the line before it. Yep. So we can, we can add the semicolon back here and rebuild. And you can see that it builds successfully. Uh, the one other thing that I want to show uh, that's really handy is um, the IDE will actually do uh, some limited error checking. So it can't do full correctness checking of your program. But for example, it can tell that you're missing this semicolon. And you can see that down here in the error list. It says it's expecting a semicolon. And it's got little red squiggles under the return, which is really useful for you know when you're just typing along and you want to make, you know, before you go spend a bunch of time building, oh, you know, my code is broken or, or incorrect. Absolutely. Um, and so all of these show up with the IntelliSense in front of it. Well, that was a lot for a first demo, wasn't that, it? That was, yeah. <laughs> so just to emphasize what you saw about debugging, when you run a console application, it starts, it runs all the code, maybe it prints something out, and then it quits. When you run that from Visual Studio, Visual Studio actually says, uh, how about I don't take this window away until you've had a chance to read the output. But if you were, for example, to go to Command Prompt and run the application, it would just finish when it was done. Not, not all applications are like this. Many Windows applications and games applications stay up until you tell them to quit. But we're using console applications. And they run, and when they're done, they quit. So the debugger gives you the opportunity to say, don't quit. Just stop. Stop maybe on the very first line of the whole program. And at that point, we can look at the variables, which we don't have any of, but we will have plenty soon enough. You can watch how execution goes through your application, and you can come to understand it. Now, one thing that many people don't realize, once they've learned you can run your application by clicking that big green play triangle, that's what they do when they just want to run it. It is slower to run under the debugger. You should only run under the debugger if you're actually planning to debug your application. Otherwise, you should run without debugging, which you can also do from inside Visual Studio. I think you showed them back yes, already. I, I, you got, I got, merged, got excited. I merged two That's demos together. I was just so excited to show debugging. So if I've been using C++ since before Microsoft had a C++ compiler, and that's over 21 years, um, then how long has C++ been a thing? So 1979 is apparently when Bjarna started to, to work on it and to tell people about it. And it got the name in 1983, which is 30 years now. That's Bjarne Straustra, who yes. is the creator of the language. One person who said, this would be a good idea, and, uh, and set out to make it happen, and is still very active in uh, C++, 
and its future and its growth as the, day, as the time goes by. So it's been around as C++ for 30 years, and it's an ISO standard. And this is kind of a, a weird thing for some people. It doesn't belong to any company or person or organization other than the organization that is standard C++. And this ISO standard has a committee that meets hundreds now of people, yeah, yes? Yeah, they they they've had about 100 people at the last few meetings. Uh, so it's a big group from dozens of companies and organizations. So it's not all commercial. Some of the, uh, there's people from the open source community, people from uh, universities. Uh, lots of research has been going into new language features for C++. Yeah, and they are working on the language, and there's also a library that uh, comes with the language that the capabilities of the library are set by the standards committee and you have to go through the standards process to get something changed in the library, but then each individual vendor is responsible for shipping and implementation of the library with their tools. I think you can't really mix and match, yeah? Uh, no, generally uh, you have to use a particular library with uh, tools. So for example, um, our standard library only works uh, on Windows with our uh, compiler, and it's largely, I mean, we use you know, we, it's, it's tightly coupled to the compiler. Like, there's certain things in the standard library that can only be implemented with help from the compiler. Um, you have to know something about what's happening under the covers in order to write exactly, that library. Exactly, yes. Um, so there, there is some tight coupling there, but you generally don't need to worry about it. When you, when you get a compiler package for Windows, you may be using ours, you may be using another one, um, it'll have everything you need, or it should have everything you need. That's, um, that's the whole point of a standard. Exactly. Uh, the one other thing to mention about the history is because C++ is so old and because you know it didn't really start in 1979, it started much earlier when C was invented um, since it has mostly retained backward compatibility with C. Uh, the important thing is that it's really old and over the last 40 years we've learned a lot about software development. So the way that we write clean code today and, and how we know how to write the best code using the best practices um, is very different from what we did 40 years ago. And so a lot of code that you see out there in the wild is going to be rather ugly, or it may use a lot of non-modern things. Um, it's really only been the last 15 years or so that we've really started to understand how best to use uh, the, the facilities that C++ has to write really great code, um, maybe a bit earlier in the 90s. But generally, about 15 years has been how long uh, this modern C++ that we're going to be showing you has, has developed. Yeah, so if you have a book that, I don't know, one of your parents used in college to learn C++ from, please do not look at that book. Like, don't even open it, because it's going to be full of old school, we don't do it like that anymore, that's harder than it needs to be ways of coming at C++. And what James and I want to show you today is that C++ is not a scary language. It's a very powerful and expressive language with elegance, and um, expressivity, that's a word that I find myself using a lot lately mm -hmm. about choosing a way to write your code that makes it obvious to whoever reads it what it does. Yep. And uh, those and scary tricks that people used to pull off with no more. Absolutely. And because of its age, there's often uh, multiple ways to do things. So for example, um, we may see later uh, today, uh, there's many ways to initialize variables, um, at least three or four. And this is largely because of age. Like there was one way to do it in C, and then we learned, oh, hey, we, that doesn't work for everything, so let's introduce a new way. So then we had two ways, and they didn't really work very well. There were two of them, uh, so we came up with a third way, and it mostly works. Um, and so it's the third way that we'll be showing you because you should be using it pretty much everywhere in your code. Right. So you may find C++ code elsewhere that doesn't look exactly like what we're showing you. That doesn't make that code wrong or our code wrong. It just makes them different because we have a, a lot of different ways to do the same thing. But we do kind of feel pretty strongly that our way is right for that readability and expressivity. Yep. C++ is known as a strongly typed language. And that means that types are really critical to every kind of reasoning you want to make about your program. In some languages, you can say, oh, I have this variable, and I'm going to put stuff in it. Like, I might put a number in it, and then later I'll put a date in it, and then uh, some words, and then I'll try to do arithmetic with that. And the tools in those languages just have to kind of roll with that. C++ is strongly typed. When I say I'm going to have a variable and put a number in it, I'm going to put a number in it. And if I try to put something in it that's not a number, the compiler is actually going to give me an error. If I say I'm going to put a certain kind of number and then I put a different number, for example, the difference between an integer and a floating point number that has a, a decimal part as well as the integer part, I may get 
unexpected results or warnings or even errors depending on what I'm doing. The idea that every single variable has a type, it doesn't change its type, and that that uh, enables the compiler to make some decisions about your application is really the one thing that you have to get in order to, to work well in C++ because you'd be frustrated if you don't. Now the cool part is we can make up our own types. It's an object-oriented language and when we define an object we make up our own types. And then they are treated just like types, the same as number is a type or I've been saying string and date but they're not built in fundamental types in C++. They are defined in libraries. The fundamental types come with the compiler you define your own, and then you teach the compiler the rules about your type. Why don't we All right. demonstrate with some code? Yeah, so we have this demo here. And in this demo, we just have a simple main function like we had before. We're not going to do any I.O. We're actually just going to debug through it and show uh, some of the fundamental types. So. First, what we have here is an int. So an int can store an integer number. Um, we're going to initialize it with the value 2, which, of course, is an integer. And we can see here in the autos window, like we were showing before, that it shows now the local variable i, and it's got a value of 2. Now, an integer can only store integers. It cannot store um, uh, decimal values or anything with a fractional part. So for example, if we try to store 3.2 in it, you'll see that i now has the value of 3. Um, so it, it truncated it. It removed the 2. Now note that this is not rounding, it's actually truncation. So for example, if we were to round 2.9 to an integer, it would round to 3 because it's closer to 3 than to 2. But um, because we're going to truncate, we'll see that when we do i equals 2.9, we actually end up with i with the value of 2. And you didn't get any error messages when those truncations happened. They just silently truncated. That is correct. There were no error messages, but we will see in a moment. The compiler will let you know when you're doing uh, something that is potentially problematic. Um, so then an integer can also uh, hold negative values. So for example here, we've got negative 1, and we've assigned the value negative 1 to it. Corresponding to the int type, there's also a type called unsigned int. And unsigned int can only store positive values. Now you might say, why would we ever want that when we could have all the benefits of, of uh, int, which can store, store negative values? Um, so unsigned types can store uh, basically twice the range. So int has a limited range. It can only store numbers between uh, negative 2 billion and about positive 2 billion, something around there. And uh, unsigned int can store numbers from 0 to 4 billion. So, so that's way better yeah, if, if you're if counting you, everyone on Earth or something. If you have, yes, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you really need, um, generally, there's different schools of thought on this, but generally uh, you should avoid unsigned int for most things. Uh, there's a few things that we'll see later in this course where it's used commonly, but uh, generally you should use integers. So you can see here we have an unsigned int. We're going to initialize it with the value of 0. And then we're going to try and assign a negative value to it. Now you should note that this is, this is OK, uh, but it's going to end up with some enormous number. Um, there's a rhyme and reason to how this works, but you should just note that it's not going to store the negative value. It's going to store this other thing. Um, so then we have this type called double, which is basically uh, a decimal number. Um, actually, I'm going to take that back. It's not a decimal number. So it's, it's what we call a floating point number. Um, and it's binary decimal. So it can't represent um, all decimal fractions exactly. Uh, just like if you try and represent uh, one third as a decimal number, you won't be able to do it. It's 0.3 repeating on and on and on forever. Um, so here, but basically it, it can store with certain limited precision um, uh, fractional numbers. And the name is just a fluke of history that there was a type called float, which was smaller. And then uh, double was better than that, was double that precision. Right. But no one uses float anymore now. We all use double. Yeah. Um, so, so there are other types. And we'll, I think we'll see a list uh, that will show some of these uh, after the demo. Um, so we can see here that we're assigning the value of uh, 2.7, or we're initializing the double with this value 2.7. And it's not exactly 2.7. It's 2.7000 and then 2 here at the end. And that's because, again, we can't represent anything exactly. Or we cannot represent some things exactly. Um, you can note that we can assign this double to our integer i, and it now has a value of 2, so that truncation occurs, you know, even if it's a double on the other side. Um, similarly, we can assign an integer to the double, and because 2 is exactly representable, it actually has the value of 2. Um, another type that we'll commonly use is bool. So bool can hold two, or two values, one of two values, 
um, it can hold either true or false. So here we can initialize it to true, and um, this flag we can uh, we can change its value to false, and the debugger very helpfully shows us that. Um, you can also assign this might seem very weird. You can also assign integers or other numeric uh, values to a uh, boolean, and basically any zero is converted into false, and any other number is converted into true. So negative numbers included become true. So here we can assign a 7 to the flag, and you can see it changes value again to true. Um, so some of these conversions didn't look very safe. Like for example, you know, this I or this u equals negative 2 here, where we assign, you know, a negative value to an unsigned type uh, object doesn't make much sense. No, the whole point about unsigned is it's not supposed to hold negative numbers. Right. Or similarly, up here where we lose this precision of, of, the, um, of the double or the floating point values when we assign them to integers. So the compiler did not complain. This is not an error. But if I rebuild, you can see that it did give us warnings. And so these warnings tell us, hey, there's something that's pretty unusual about your code. You might want to look at this. Um, you should try and make sure that your code is always warning free. You, you never want to, uh, basically, you want to make sure that you've addressed all the issues that the compiler is concerned about. Um, sometimes you actually want to do what the compiler is complaining about. Like it's, it's saying, I don't want you to do this. You know, are you sure this conversion is correct? And you say, yes, I, I actually do want to I'm do that, that truncation. I'm doing that on purpose. Thank you. Yes. Um, and so you can use, uh, there's a way to do that, and I think we'll show that in, in, a, in a future section. Yeah, they're going to see that shortly. Okay. And I often tell people the compiler is your friend. Absolutely. And people who ignore warnings and say, ah, it built, we're good. No, the, it's trying to tell you that, are you sure you wanted to take this 2.9, which has a fractional part, and put it in an integer? Are you sure you want to take this negative number and put it in an unsigned number, or this uh, integer and put it into a Boolean? Are you sure? And you should never, ever ignore a compiler warning. In fact, uh, my C++ heroes, all there's a setting, which we're not going to burden you with today, but there's a setting to actually treat warnings as errors. Yep. And my heroes all use that setting all the time. So if there's even one warning their program won't build, it forces you to go deal with the warning. Yep. We use that for all of our projects on our team, you know, just at the highest possible warning level because it's that important. It's that important. So all of these should really be fixed, and we'll show you. I mean, obviously, one way to fix them would be, why are you trying to put 2.9 into an integer? But there's also a way to tell the compiler, I meant to do that, and uh, we will show you that. So I know you saw um, a, lot of, a lot of types just then, and I thought it would be a good idea to give you a little bit of a list. The, there are an awful lot of types in C++, uh, and it incorporates all of the types from C before it. The ones you're going to use, you're going to use int for representing a, an integer, you know, up to... 2 billion, which means that probably any number you can think of that you're going to want to really use as a number, you can fit in there. Unsigned int. If you really wanted to make sure that everyone reading your program knew this could never have a negative number in it, you could go ahead and use an unsigned int. And there's a, a couple places where using it suppresses a compiler warning, so that's when I end up using it. Mm -hmm. Double, bool, and, and there's a non-type called void that you may see used in the sort of places that we're putting type names right now. And it means nothing. And it means, for example, uh, it doesn't have a type. You'll see it more often in older programs, but there is a few places where you'll see it uh, in, in modern C++ code as well. And just It means nothing. Now, you may bump into things like car, which some people say char. Are you a char guy? I say or? care because it's, care. it's short for character. character. Yes. So there, there's three ways to say that. Car, the correct way. Uh, care and char. Uh, and they're all the same thing. They all, they all represent a character. And should be noted, uh, when we say character, what it really means is byte. So yes. it represents a one-byte integer. That's correct, basically. because some characters can't be represented. Uh, some characters require two bytes to represent them. And that's what the wcar underscore t and its relatives, there's, there's a number of types related to displaying different kinds of characters. Right. We're not particularly going to use those. Uh, then there's long and short. These are kind of really historical remnants at this point from times when, you know, we used to have 8-bit machines and 16-bit machines, 32-bit machines, finally 64-bit machines. And this is a language that's been around for all of that. And uh, so we used to have a lot more different kinds of integer data types. And I mentioned float, which is the older version of the double precision. And there's a page on MSDN. And if you're going to be a C++ programmer and, and use Visual Studio, you're going to get used to looking stuff up on MSDN from time to time. And James, I think you have yep. that page up.
This is a list of the fundamental types in C++, the ones that the language supports, and then I believe it also includes some uh, specific types that are uh, supported in the Microsoft libraries that may not be supported uh, throughout the rest of the universe. Right, or things that are um, used, for, for example, like we said, uh, some of the standard library can only be implemented using compiler help, uh, so some of these types would fall into that would category. Fall into that, for sure. So uh, if you suddenly want to know, gosh, how many bytes does that data type take up, which I actually never want to know, but, but uh, people for some reason want to, uh, you can certainly come to this page. Or if you just want to remember how to spell something or uh, that you think there was a type that, that met a particular need you have, you can come to this page and check it out. Now I mentioned that when we took a floating point number like 3.2 and tried to put it into an integer, the compiler knew that a conversion needed to be made. And in that conversion, it just threw away the fractional part and put the integer part into the integer. And there's actually a similar thing that happens when you take an integer like 2 and put it into a floating point. There needs to be a conversion. And the compiler really is your friend. It knows how to convert all kinds of things back and forth to each other, and it will if you give it half a chance. But there are times when it's a good idea for you to make it clear that you would like to have that done. You would like to have your floating point or double number converted into an integer. And this syntax here on this slide is how you do that. Instead of saying i equals 3.2, you call this function called static underscore cast. Now there's a lot of punctuation in this line which you will know in an hour. For now, just trust me, the angle brackets, uh, what goes in the angle brackets here is int. It's what, what you'd like it to be converted to, the type you want to make this into. And in the round brackets is the value that you would like to have converted. When I read i equals 3.2, I may forget that i is an integer, and especially if it's not i equals 3.2, if it's, uh, what do we have in the demo, i equals d? I may not have the type of both of those numbers memorized, so I may not spot that there's a type conversion happening there. When you use this static cast, you make it really clear to everybody, hey, look, I'm changing types. Maybe I'm going to throw away some of my data. I'm doing this on purpose because I meant to do it. That's grit. I mean, that's really, when I read your code, I should know what your code is trying to do. As well, as a bonus, it makes the compiler stop warning you about it. Uh, that's the other thing I say besides the compiler is your friend. I say it's your foot. So yes. if you want to shoot yourself in the foot, the compiler's like, hey, you're doing it on purpose? Okay. Yes. No warning. I don't need to warn you. You said you knew there was a conversion here. Or as one of our, though, as one of our compiler uh, developers uh, likes to say, um, you don't want to help the compiler. So if the compiler can do something on its own, uh, don't try and, you know, help it out there. Let it do it. That way, uh, if something changes in the future or if we get better diagnostics in the future that might detect, you know, different types of uh, weird, odd things that you might not have meant, um, you know, you're not suppressing the compiler. You're not uh, That's preventing right. the compiler from helping you in the future. Right. So if you, uh, if you write the code without the, the static cast and then there's an issue, then you say, no, I, I meant to do that. Then you can go in and add it in. Don't uh, do it automatically uh, before you even know whether there's a problem or not. So let's uh, see casting in action. Yes. So I have here, um, it's basically a similar program to the one we had before. We still have an int i and a double d and a bool flag. Um, but here we've replaced all of those weird looking conversions with uh, uses of these casts. So if we build it, we will see that there are no errors and no warnings. So that, that's a good sign. And we can see that if we run the program, um, Basically, as we step through, we'll see that it has the same behavior as before. So when we assigned the 3.2 to i, it was converted to int. So this was what the compiler was doing under the hood. But we've added this cast to say, compiler, I know what I'm doing. This is exactly what I meant to do. Um, one thing uh, I guess we can also show here. So when we're printing things to the console, they don't have to be strings. Like before, we had the string hello world. Now uh, we can print an integer. and the Basically, the library will go and format it as you know a string for you. So here we can see we're printing i, and if we go to the output window, we can see that, or to the console window, we can see that we've printed negative one. Uh, stepping through, you know, we can just see basically the same thing with all the rest of these. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the casting takes away the uh, warnings from the compiler. Um, this particular demo is super artificial. I mean, why, yeah. why would you take a constant number like 3.2 and then stick it into an integer so as to throw the 0.2 away? Uh, we know we're just showing you this code so that 
you will understand what happens in some of your code. Uh, one of my favorite newbie errors is when somebody writes uh, double ratio equals one divided by three. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to show them what the compiler will give them? When yeah, they that's do actually that? that's actually a good example. So, um, as we noted, uh, integer types can only deal with integers. Uh, so two is an integer, but so are, for example, one or three and two. Um, so we build this, and you might think, oh, well, this is one half, but we can't represent one half in an integer. So when we run this, we'll see that well, the result has been truncated, and we just get the 1. We've lost that 0.5. So often what people will say is, oh, well, I can you know, turn this into a double. Right. So now i is a floating point value, so we can hold that 0.5. So clearly uh, the value is now going to be 1.5. And it's not. It's 1.0. The reason for this is that this expression, 3 divided by 2, it doesn't matter where that appears. It's always going to have the same value. And because both of those are integers, we end up performing integer math on them. So we end up dividing 3 by 2, which yields 1, with a remainder of 1. So there's, no, we, there's no 0.5. Like yeah. There's just this remainder of 1. And we throw away that remainder. We say we're not going to use that. And so you end up with this uh, double precision number with lots and lots of zeros on the end of your 1. Something that happened fairly recently to C++ was uh, adding the capability to leverage the fact that the compiler knows when you're making these assignments what the types are. So when you take uh, integer 3 divided by integer 2, the result is an integer. If you were to change it to a 3.0 divided by 2, then the result would be a double. And that's how you get around this problem. But it also puts you in the position of, if you then declared the type of the variable yourself explicitly, sometimes the compiler warns you and says, that type doesn't go with this expression that you're calling. And uh, I think a lot of us have wanted this for a long time, is to say to the compiler, if you're so smart, why don't you do it? And that capability is actually uh, in the language, mm -hmm. in a keyword called auto. Yes. So unfortunately, we cannot use this lovely initialization syntax. Uh, and this is an oddity of the language. I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so what we can do, there's another way to initialize things. You can use the equal sign, just like, you know, it looks like assignment, but it's still initialization. And we can change this to just say auto, which means compiler, go tell me what this type, or go figure out what the type of this expression is. So 3 divided by 2 is an int expression, so it's type int. And so i here is an integer. And if we run, we can see that i is indeed of type int, and it has the value of 1. And in the IDE, when we're editing, you can hover over that over i. Ah, yeah. you hover over the i. And you can see here that it says, ah, oh, it's an int. So the IDE can tell you what that type is, even though you've just said auto. So it can, it can do that deduction. Um, then if you change the expression, if you make that 3.0 divided yes. by 2. Then if we hover over the i, you'll see it's now a double. Double i. So a lot of people uh, come from other languages that are not strongly typed, and they, they think that this is the type adjusting to match the expression, but it's not. It's the keyword auto says to the compiler, you figure out what to strongly type this variable as, and that will be its type uh, for the rest of time. Right. So in this particular example, there's no, there is, to the compiler, there's no difference between this, this declaration here, auto i equals 3.0 over 2. And if we were to put double here, it's exactly the same. There's, there's no difference between them at all. Well, auto is, is shorter than double, but longer uh, than int. Yes. So well. <laughs> I tend to type whichever is the shortest. Yeah. Yeah, there is still great debate about you know, what the right balance is between using type inference and, and not using type inference. But yes, but still. Just it, know that it's a tool in your toolbox. And you may see auto from time to time in our demos where the things we are uh, declaring have longer types than int or double, and we don't feel like typing all of it. But understand, the compiler does not care. Uh, it's the same as if we had typed out its name with pressing keys. Boy, the word type is overloaded, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so let me uh, sort of recap of what we've shown so far. The most important thing about C++, in my mind, is that it is a strongly typed language, that uh, the compiler knows what the types of things are, and even expressions like 3 divided by 2 or 3.0 divided by 2 have a type. And the compiler will keep track of, is this OK what you're putting in here from type to type? Since writing your own classes is essentially designing your own types, it's a really important thing for you to get. Now that you've seen applications running and debugging and uh, being 
basically interacted with, it's time to actually uh, move in the next module into decision making and applications that do something. So that's what we'll be doing uh, when we come back. So we're going to have a little bit of a break. Don't go too far away. And um, we're going to uh, pick up in the same uh, position. Yes. And don't worry, it gets more exciting. Yeah, we'll see. The basics are always a little boring, but... That's right. Once the groundwork is in place, yeah. then we can do some really cool stuff. And there will, there will be more punctuation. I think that's fair. Absolutely. To... <laughs>